Would you like to tell us a wee bit about yourself? Uh, my name is Jim White. I was born in Twicker in 1944. Um, so I'll be 73 next month. Um, I think I was, looking back, I think I was very fortunate uh, having my childhood in Tweka. Um, when you see what children's childhood is like now compared to, to our childhood. Mm -hmm. um, when I was born in Tweka, growing up, everybody knew everybody else. We all played together before we went to school. We all went to school together. We were in the same class uh, at Tweker. It was a junior secondary school then, um, and I stayed at Tweker School till I was 15. So I had the same friends right through my school days in Tweker. And as I say, we, we, we played together, um, and we went to school together, and we enjoyed all the activities uh, that were available at that time. Um, before I went to school, we, all, we always played outside. Mm -hmm. All our activities were outside. You very seldom were in anybody else's house apart from your own parents and your grandparents and your relations. But you were very seldom in anybody else's house. Everything was done outside. So what did you do to pass the time? Uh, there was a playground. I lived in the Coalboard scheme at Tweker and there was a playground there and we played football there and in the better weather, when it was school holidays, uh, we put up nets and we played tennis there. Uh, and then a lot of activities were down in the Glen. Um, there was a burn run through the Glen and we dammed that up in the summertime and that's where most of the people all learned to swim. Uh, we climbed trees and we made camps and we roasted potatoes and most of the summer holidays were spent down in the Glen. Happy days. Happy days. Did you find that a lot of the friends you, you made at that time? You're still friends with now? Oh, I, I was still keep in touch. Although we've all scattered about a bit, um, we still keep in touch. So when you left school, you went to work in the yard? Went to work for the coal board. Um, I got an apprenticeship uh, and as an electrician. Um, because at that time, most of the people in the village worked in the pits. So although we were, all the kids were friends, all the men were friends because they all worked together in the pits and it was more or less just the thing that when you left school you would go and work for the coal board. So you knew there was a job there for you? There was a job there. When I left school there was jobs for everybody that wanted to work. Maybe the jobs weren't the best of jobs but there were jobs available for everybody that wanted to work. Again, when I left school we weren't under the same pressure to do well academically. As I say, there was jobs for everybody, no matter what your, your talents were, you, you could always find a job. And th there wasn't any pressure to do well or you wouldn't get a job. So which apprenticeship did you opt for? I went for an electrician. Uh, and at that time, Tweker Yard was there. And that was the workshops for the whole of central Scotland. I would think there must have been at least 500 men worked there and they did all the supplies for all the different pits, made all the hutches and the rails and all these things were done at the workshops at Tweka and distributed to all the other pits. And you also did the housing repairs as well, didn't you? They did the housing repairs for the coal board houses. Uh -huh. Then uh, I went to Bedley Workshops, that was the electrical workshops, uh, and I worked there for six months as part of the apprenticeship. Um, and then I went to Twicker One Colliery, and I worked there for three years. Um, Twicker One Colliery closed, and I moved to Grace Hill, uh, and I worked at Grace Hill for three years and Grace Hill closed. Then I moved to Cardown, up at Steps, and I worked there 
for 15 years until Mrs Thatcher decided there wasn't going to be any more pits. Uh, and I moved through to Fife, to Bogside Mine, and I was told that when we went there, we were guaranteed 25 years' work. I was there for six months. The strike started, the mine got flooded, and I got made redundant from the coal board. And I thought the world had come to an end <laughs> because there was no more pits, because th that's, that was our livelihood. Um, and I thought the world had come to an end. I've heard that if you were trained at the yard in any of the apprenticeships, you could get a job anywhere because the training was that good. It, it was. I we were very fortunate, because, especially uh, electrical and engineering, because uh, electrical, you worked with all different voltages, mm -hmm. uh, low voltages, high voltages, and they said if you could work down the pit as an electrician, you could work everywhere because you wouldn't come across anything outside the pit that you hadn't came across when you worked in the pit. Uh, and anybody leaving the, the pits as a tradesman never had any problems finding jobs anywhere else. So when you went down the pit to do work, what did the electrician do down the pit? Uh, we maintained all the electrical machinery. Um, when I worked at Tweaker One Pit at first, it was more or less sort of picks and shovels. Um, but when I moved up to Cardown, Cardown was mechanised and it was machinery that cut and loaded the coal. So th that was a big change for me. But it was, it was really good experience. And I was really happy working in the pit. And I'd have been quite happy to work in the pit till I retired if that would have been possible. What were the working conditions like in the pit? Well, the, they were quite poor looking back on it, but you didn't really think that much about it because you didn't really know all that much. You didn't know any better. The first couple of pits I worked in, Twicker One and Grace Hill, as I say, they, they, they were mechanised. Um, they, were, they were dusty pits in quite wet conditions as well. Um, when I went to Cardown, and Cardown was mechanised with the, the big machinery, looking back on it, there was a lot more dust going around then. And when I went to Cardown at first, we didn't wear masks or anything. It's protection. Was there no health and safety guidelines? Well, very few, very few. Um, we, we just, it was something that you never thought about. But so looking back on it, 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 it was, there was lots and lots of dust flying about. So how did the miners cope with that dust? Well, it was just what you were used to. And you knew that before you went there because all your, your fathers and your uncles had all worked in the pits. And I remember my grandfather coming home through the pit covered in coal dust when they didn't have washing facilities. So it, you just expected that that's what it would be when you went to work in the pit, that you would be covered in dust. But you didn't need to think at that time the harm that it would be doing to yourself. It was just one of the hazards of the job. Were there any um, dust suppression uh, mechanisms or systems? Uh, uh, latterly, I would say maybe the last five years or so that I worked in the pit, that they were bringing in dust suppression. On the, the big machinery, they had uh, water um, which sprayed in front of the machines, but that didn't always work. And if the, all, although the water wasn't working, the machines were still working. So it, it wasn't all that well controlled. Okay. They would take dust samples. Uh, they, they, they had safety officers and, and people like that who took dust samples and they get sent through to a lab in Edinburgh, but what the results are uh, that I, were, I, I never knew. Were there any masks available for you to use? In the, the mine dry where they were driving in the mines, um, they used the mask that worked in the mines. Did they have them in the mines? They used the men that worked there, because there were nowhere for the dust to go, they used masks, but on the coal faces and things. You, I, I never used, I never wore a mask. Well, they, they, they just weren't available. <laughs> uh, 
And I worked at the coal face as well, uh, maintaining the machinery. Were you given any training on coal workers' pneumoconiosis and silicosis? No. It was never mentioned. So, am I right in saying every, every nine of you you had a cold? More or less. Uh, uh, How did you escape? Uh, Luck? Uh, probably, probably. Uh, 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 uh. Would you like to tell us about some of the characters you used to work with? Oh, well, there, there was a lot of the men uh, that, that worked in the pit had nicknames. Uh, and the, the, the worst characters in the pit, um, men that, that probably would have been very difficult to employ outside the pit, but there, there, there was jobs for them uh, in the pit, and especially working on the surface, uh, the, the, there was a lot of characters worked about the pit. I remember a story, one of the, the, the characters that worked at the pit, the foreman asked him to go up to the canteen and get him 20 cigarettes. And he said, what kind of cigarettes will I get you? And the, the foreman said, uh, capsin. He says, well, if they haven't got capsin, what will I get you? He says, oh, just get me anything. And Arthur come back with two pies. <laughs> <laughs> and the foreman said, What's this? He says, well, they didn't have caps and, and you said to get you anything and I knew you liked pies. So that, that was the type, some of the type of men that, that, that worked at the pit. And they were always playing tricks on one another. There was a lot of camaraderie in the pit, but they were always playing tricks on one another. But it was all good humoured. And everybody was looked after in the pit. Some other interview you had said that when they were actually down the pit, the bosses upstairs or in the office, they were distant. It was the firemen that was in charge when they were actually down the pit and doing the shift. The, the, the men felt that they were all together doing this work and everybody else was distant. Do you know what I'm saying? That they were alone in that? Oh, well, the, the management didn't, didn't mix with the men. No, no, very seldom uh, the, the management mixed with, with the men. And they all sort of looked after each other? The men looked after themselves. Uh, uh -huh. It certainly gave me the impression that they looked after their own health and safety issues there because there was nothing coming from above, you know, no care. It's no, case if, you, no. if your finger came off, well, you just wrapped a bandage around it and that, that, that's waited right. till you get home to fix it and go on with your uh -huh, shift. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Do you want to tell us some of the nicknames that you spoke about earlier? Uh, in in, in Twicker, uh, there was uh, Curly Bell, uh, Beaky Roberts, uh, Nolt Mulvey, uh, Smokey Graham, uh, Bunny Bell, Bendy Bell, uh, I had them all written down, I, I should have brought that with me. And you said that there was never any offence to you? No, no, but most of these people were always known by their nicknames and nobody really knew what their, their proper names were, they were just referred to as that and the answer to that. So. The, a lot of them, nobody knew what their, their, their proper names were. Even the, the, their wife and their families called them with their nicknames. Strange when you, when you think back on it. So you've enjoyed uh, being brought up in Tweaker? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. What age were you when you left Tweaker? I left Tweaker when I was 44. And I moved to Kirkintala. Uh -huh. And you continued to do the, the job you've been trained for in the pit? No, I changed direction. Um, uh, when I got made redundant from the coal board, I went and worked with MOD at the gun range at Milton Akamsey. Um, I worked there for eight years and get made redundant from there. Um, and I was looking for another job. Um, I was always interested in first aid, um, 
I was in the, the, the boys' brigade, but th that was another thing. When we were young, everybody was involved with uh, activities uh, in, in the village, and most of the activities were connected through the church, um, the boys' brigade, uh, and the Sunday school. Um, I joined the Life Boys um, when I was seven, uh, and then went on to the Boys' Brigade. Uh, I became an officer in the Boys' Brigade, and uh, I played in the Boys' Brigade pipe band. We had a pipe band, and I played in the pipe band. Um, and we went on holiday. That was the only chance of holidays you got was the Boys' Brigade camp. We went at Glasgow Fair. The furthest we went was Ireland. Most of the time it was in Scotland, like places like Malport and Dunoon and Arbroath. Um, but but that, that was really good. I enjoyed my time uh, in the Boys' Brigade. Uh, and then we went to church um, and Sunday school. And we had Sunday school parties at Christmas. Um, the Sunday school trip was a big event in the village because everybody in the village could go to the Sunday school trip, whether you attended Sunday school or not, uh, and there'd be, what, nine or ten buses would leave. It was usually the first Saturday in June um, for the Sunday school trip, and the, the, that was a really enjoyable time. The Boys Brigade in the Gilgia were always a big a big group in Tweckern, wasn't there? That, that, that's right. I was a, it was over 40 uh, in the Boys Brigade company when I was there, and as I say, we had the... Uh, we had our own pipe band. I remember the display. Uh, and I got interested in first aid when I was in the boys' brigade. And when I went to the coal board, the coal board, I must say, um, encouraged first aid and I joined the mines rescue service uh, when I was with the coal board. Um, and I got training in first aid there. So I was always interested in, in first aid. Um, and when I went, to look for another job. There was a job available at Woodley Psychiatric Hospital and I thought I'll try that and I went there and I got a job in occupational therapy and I went to Langside College when I was 52 and did a two-year part-time course in occupational therapy. Finished at that and got a job with the community mental health team and I worked there till I was 67 and I enjoyed, although it was a different job, I enjoyed that job as well. So I've been very fortunate in my employment. When you worked for the Mines Rescue, did you have to do any rescue? I was at three different incidents, mm -hmm. but they, they weren't in this area, they were through in Fife. So do you want to tell us a wee bit about them or? what the procedure was before you were sent down? Well, you had to do training. Uh, they had a rescue station at Coat Bridge uh, and they had full -time, a full-time staff there. It was run like a fire station. They had full-time staff and they covered the whole of Scotland and then the part-time rescue men, people like myself, did training and we assisted at, if there was any incidents. Mm -hmm. Uh, we wore breathing apparatus uh, to go underground if, if there was a fire underground or like an explosion. There, there was an explosion at Cardown. I can't remember the date of that. It was maybe three or four years before the pit closed. Um, and I was, in, I, I was actually doing a training at Cope Bridge Rescue Station the morning that happened. And the... the station was called out and I went to that and there was a, quite a few men got burned in that but the, there was no fatalities but there was a few men got burned in that. Did you help to pull them in out or ask the other people about my colleagues? They were pulled out by the, the, their colleagues before the, the rescue team got at that incident but there were other incidents where the, the, the mine rescue men uh, actually had to. The, the Ochen Geecht disaster, I was about 12 or 13 when that happened, but I, I remember that. But I think like uh, a lot of other incidents, bad incidents, like things that happened during the war, men never really spoke 
much about it, so I didn't really know what all went on there, but that had been quite horrendous, I think. Well, thanks very much for coming down and it's taking your time uh -huh. to give us some of your memories. But uh, although, as I said the last time, although I stay in Kirkendillach, my heart's still in Twekers. Now, I've got something to show you. So if you turn round that board, that picture on the left, that one there, the lady on the left, do you know her? Yeah. Uh-huh. That's Miss Neil when she was young. Is it? Uh, I know you liked her. Aye. That's Miss Neil. Everybody's always remembered as being old Funny and white enough, that's Miss Neil. You, Miss Neil, young. stayed in Party in Glasgow. And last Saturday we were in the town and we come down Byers Road and just at the corner I saw the, the sign White Street uh, and Miss Neil travelled from there for over 40 years to teach in Twegger School. Uh, I know you were blind, yeah. Mm. Well, that's why I think she was young. Miss Neil's name always comes up uh, when you talk about school. And it was, well, obviously it was the only school she taught in and that she was here for 40 years yeah. and travelled from Glasgow. I was in her last us. class. <laughs> but she came back. Take me home.